what are the things in meals that cause this inflammatory response? So one of them is simple sugar, okay? So if you have a high simple sugar meal, you have more inflammation than if you have the same meal with less simple sugar, okay? Another one is total fat. And of course, fat could come in many forms, but I'm using it in a, in a, in a general sense. So a high fat meal causes this inflammatory response following the meal. And in fact, in research, people typically use a high fat challenge to cause this process to try to understand about it and how it can be mitigated. Yeah, and we're very familiar with that at Zoe because everyone who does Zoe actually eats um, this standardized meal. It's now cookies, but it goes all yes, the way back yeah. to what Sarah Berry originally exactly. designed with yep. our first study, which sort of challenges our metabolism in this standard way that yeah. we you know, did originally with twins with both this fat and this sugar. Yeah. Because I think one of the things that's really interesting, which you haven't, I guess, touched on yet, Philip, is there's huge variation, isn't there, in this yeah. response? Yeah, so, so you, you can use sugar and fat to challenge people's met metabolism, if you like, challenge their resilience. And part of that challenge is to their inflammation. So I think this inflammatory response we're talking about is part and parcel of an adverse metabolic reaction to, to a meal. As you might imagine, there's been a lot of interest in can we tweak what's in the meal to try to reduce this inflammatory response that occurs after a meal? And you'll be relieved to know that there are a lot of things, at least in experimental settings, that can mitigate this response. So, so I mentioned fat causes this postprandial inflammation. If you replace saturated fat or a source of saturated fat with extra virgin olive oil, for example you don't get such a big response, okay? If you include nuts in the meal, you don't get such a big response. If you include vitamin C with the meal, you don't get such a big response. So maybe oxidative stress is part of this as well. If you include omega-3 fatty acids in the meal, you don't get such a big response. What you're saying, I think, is that it's not just like how much fat or how many carbs you eat that is going to cause whether or not you have this inflammation. Actually, you're getting down to the type of food is having a very different response. Just before we talk about this specifically, could you just link through for a minute between what happens when you eat this meal? Like This isn't just in the first hour. One of the reasons we do these these tests in Zoe and, and some of these are like sort of six hours after you eat is there can be like there's a sort of process yeah. that means that one person and one meal, you might be fine, and another person or another meal, you could start to cause this inflammation. So you're right that there is a lot of variation in the metabolic response to a meal. There's also a, actually quite a lot of variation in the inflammatory response to a meal as well. So you could give a whole lot of people the same amount of fat and actually they don't all, they will all show an inflammatory response, but it is quite variable. So I think part of that is, you know, what is the condition of those people beforehand? So I think if you do it in someone who's generally more healthy, they might be able to deal with it better. So they will show a smaller response. But there are also, as you mentioned, there are these more long-term effects. I mean, we think of a meal having an effect in a couple of hours after you eat it, but actually... There are these longer-term effects, and there's interesting work showing that what you have in one meal can actually affect your response to the next meal. And people have struggled to really understand how that can be. So we have cells that line our gut wall, <laughs> and they're involved in the uptake of the products of digestion and passing them out into the bloodstream. And some years ago, researchers actually at University of Reading did a study where they were able to trace what happened with things that were in the first meal. And of course, most of those things passed into the bloodstream, but they didn't all. And when you had a second meal, some hours later, you actually got things that were in the first meal coming out into the bloodstream. So they interpreted this to be actually the gut cells hang on to some of the stuff from a meal and release it later on. So I think there, there might be mechanisms to explain the sort of carryover effect into later meals.
maybe to share a little bit of, of some of the, the, the science that's come out of Zoe, because I think it's, it's really, to me, fascinating. So we had a lot more than 100,000 people yeah, yeah, now sure. do these tests. Everybody who becomes a, a member starts by doing these tests to help to, to personalize. And, and what's really interesting is we see like roughly a third of people really struggle with the fat in a meal, which means that, you know, it's sort of six hours later, for example, you can still see these raised levels of fat. And about two thirds of people, even with this lot of fat, clear it all away. Yeah. Yeah, sure. and so in my yeah. case, for example, I clear that all away, yeah. which is great. And then we look at the blood sugar responses to this meal, and we see this very, very, very wide, like 10, amazingly wide variation. And interesting, for example, there's some people like me whose blood sugar control is very poor, despite the fact that like, their ability to deal with the, the fats is quite high. And what I understand in that case is where people are struggling to deal with this, this can lead to more inflammation over time. Yeah. Is that... Yeah. And therefore that... That's like sort of saying to you quite directly, you need to change the way that you're eating if you want to lower this level of inflammation. Yeah. So, so I think from from what I've said, you might gather that both this prolonged, well, even a short elevation, but a prolonged elevation of blood sugar is harmful to inflammation, but also too much elevation or prolonged blood fat after a meal is also bad for inflammation. So both scenarios would be bad. But I don't think we know why different individuals can be so different. You know, some of it obviously is how well do we respond to insulin, but also how is our system adapted yes. to us having a lot of fat? I think one example. of the things we're hoping to see over time with Zoe members is you can see that if by shifting your diet, you might actually start to see sort of long-term yeah. improvements in some of these. And we definitely see already some improvements. Let's talk about what you can do if you've listened to all of this I mentioned some things, extra virgin olive oil, omega-3s, having nuts, having vitamin C, all help control, at least in an experimental setting, um, in a group of people, but also fiber in a meal. And, you know, maybe part of that is just slowing down the process of digestion. So, you, you know, you're letting stuff come into the bloodstream more slowly, so you're better able to handle it. And is it like one magic pill? Like if I take, you know, we often talk about extra virgin olive oil as being very good for you. Does that mean if I'm taking a shot of extra virgin olive oil three times a day, like that will solve my inflammation like a pill um, from the doctor? Is it as simple as that? I wouldn't prefer to think of it like that. Okay. I mean, I would, I would prefer to think of a long-term dietary shift away from things that are considered to be less healthy. And I mentioned in general, what they might be in the context of this postprandial inflammation and a move towards things which we think are more healthy. And, you know, olive oil, particularly extra virgin, would be part of that. More micronutrients, I mentioned vitamin C, that would be part of that. More omega-3s uh, would be part of that. More fiber. People know what extra virgin olive oil yeah. is. They know what nuts are. Yes. That was yeah, really clear. Yeah. And I know your own research, you've done a lot of your own research around omega-3. Yes. Could you maybe just tell us what omega-3 is? Because I, you know, yeah. I don't see that on the shelf like I see olive oil. Yeah. So you do see it on the shelf. It's just you have to go to a different shelf because you'll find salmon on a shelf in okay. a supermarket. So when I talk about omega-3s, I'm mainly talking about the fish sourced omega-3s, EPA and DHA. So omega-3 is a, is, a, is a general term for, for a group of fatty acids. EPA and DHA are a type of omega-3. Okay. They are, as I mentioned, sort of uniquely linked with, with fish and other seafood. They seem to have quite pronounced anti-inflammatory roles, both if you put them in a meal, they will help to mitigate this meal-driven inflammation. If you have this inflammation already going, be it high grade, but that's a disease like arthritis, or this low grade persistent inflammation associated with aging, are there dietary components that can dampen that inflammation? More importantly, are there dietary components that can help you resolve the inflammation? There's lots of things in the diet that are anti-inflammatory. <laughs> They include omega-3s, which I'll come back to shortly, but also some of the vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin E are anti-inflammatory. Lots of the polyphenols from plants, so the things that give fruits, vegetables, berries, and so on, their colors, they're also anti-inflammatory. Uh, things in nuts are anti-inflammatory. Gut microbiome is also a driver of inflammation, but also could be anti-inflammatory if you get it 
Right. So there's lots of things in the diet that we can use to mitigate ongoing inflammation. I think these omega-3s, EPA and DHA that come from fish, and they're also in fish oil supplements, by the way. Um, so people can go to a different shelf and get some EPA and DHA. And we might want to consider that in the context of people who choose a vegetarian or vegan approach. We've been working on EPA and DHA for 30 years now. They are anti-inflammatory. Okay, that's clear. Lots of experiments show that. But the really interesting thing has been discovered in the last 15 years or so. This process of resolution of inflammation, the turning off, you know, flicking the light switch off, if you like, involves chemicals again. So everything in the body is involving chemicals, sending signals. Researchers in Boston discovered that some of the key chemicals in resolution of inflammation are actually made from EPA and DHA in the body. So EPA and DHA are the, the substrates, the starting point for making chemicals that turn off inflammation. People have studied omega-3s, EPA and DHA and arthritis actually since the 1980s. And it's well described that high levels of EPA and DHA as a supplement can help people with arthritis in terms of painful joints, tender joints, stuff like that, morning stiffness. And everyone always said, this is an anti-inflammatory effect. But actually, if you think these are people who've already got high-grade inflammation, I think what's happening is EPA and DHA are acting to resolve the inflammation. So actually to take that high grade and bring it down a bit. And that's why people with arthritis benefit from EPA and DHA. Imagine someone's listening to this and saying, like, I want to understand how to make some shifts to my diet yeah. in order to um, reduce this yeah, inflammation. Yeah, yeah. Maybe starting with the sort of omega-3 and oily fish, I know that's yeah. your big focus. How strong is the evidence, in your opinion, that, you know, yes, if you're willing to eat fish, you should be adding oily fish to your um, diet. Will it for, make a difference? For me, the evidence is very strong. Okay. Okay. Yes, we have animal studies, we have all sorts of studies, but, you know, I'm mainly interested in human evidence, right? Because, you know, doing something in a laboratory in some mice is one thing, but we, we need human evidence. Yeah. And in human research in nutrition, we really, in general, we have two types of research. One is where you look at diets, foods, nutrients, levels of nutrients in people's blood, and you track what happens to those people over time. So, you know, we call that epidemiology. The epidemiology of omega-3s is extremely strong. In other words, people who eat more fish or people who eat more EPA and DHA or people who have more EPA and DHA in their blood have a much better long-term health outcome. Less heart disease, less dementia, some cancers, less cancer, less metabolic disease, all that stuff. So the epidemiology is very strong. The other type of study we have is, you know, treating nutrition a bit like a pharmaceutical, so a randomized control trial. Typically, these are smaller in size and shorter. So they might involve tens or hundreds of people. But I think if you step back and look at the really important things like heart disease, for example, even from randomized control trials, there's pretty good evidence that higher intake of EPA and DHA reduces risk of heart disease and mortality from heart disease. And certainly they impact beneficially lots of the biomarkers that tell you about risk. So I think for me, the evidence is quite strong. And I personally would recommend that people should incorporate these sort of fatty fish in their diet if, if they can.